Welcome to another episode of the Ranting Cast. Frank Arcari, John Karuba here. Uh, we got a week's worth of Sabre games to talk about. Well, three games, really. And then we saw the stuff with the Bills yesterday. We haven't really talked much Bills on the on this show, but I think uh, when we get into the next segment, I got to do a little rant on them because they really pissed me off yesterday. Yeah. But... John, how you doing? Uh, we'll we'll get we'll talk some sabers first. Yeah, that sounds good. I, I, I you're not alone, Frank. I needed to collect myself as well after that Bills fiasco yesterday. But uh, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, yeah, starting with the sabers. I mean, uh, well, I guess we'll jump with the Arizona game first. And um, you know, I actually thought they played pretty well. I thought they were the better team the first two periods against the Coyotes. Um, they just were not able to really get consistent offense as far as scoring wise, but overall they carried a lot of the play. Now, yes, they had the defensive mishap early in the game and the Coyotes score like 26 seconds in. And, you know, that certainly doesn't help, but overall I was happy in the first and second period. I will say the third period, I know it was a longer delay during the second intermission because of what happened with the Zambonis, but that third period was probably one of the most, um, I want to say, maybe disappointing third periods we've seen from this team in a while. It seemed like they didn't have the same energy. You know, one thing that I, I've always admired about Coach Granado is he gets this team to play, fight hard. We've seen it. We've talked about it. And you saw it in the first two periods. But I think of the third period, they may have been a little bit deflated by the lack of success they were having. And then Arizona started to grab control of the game a little bit more. But, I mean, overall, two-thirds of that game, the Sabres were the better team. They just ran into a good goalie, and they just couldn't score. That was really the way to sum that one up as far as what I saw. I don't know if it was more <sighs> deflated. If anything, I think it was more frustrated. Right. Like, at least how I would how I, I would think of it. Okay. Is, you're Fair. right. I mean, they – They've been that they were the better team in that in that game by far. I mean, their expected goals for percentage in that game was almost 72 percent in the Sabres favor. Right. Um, you have the miscue early on and that leads to a goal and it's like, OK, whatever. It's, you know, we'll get it back and then they don't get it back, really. I mean, Tage, Tage does tie it up on the power play. Yeah. Um, but then after that, they can't do anything at five on five the rest of the game. I mean. 68% of their of the shot attempts in that game were for Buffalo. 40, it was 47-22. Um high danger chances was 8 to 3 in favor of Buffalo. This is all at 5v5 as well. Um but even then, I mean, it's still it was in the Sabres favor the whole time. They controlled the offense for most of the game. A lot of their most of their shot attempts did come in and in you know that middle of the in between the face off dots above the right above the net. So like that's a place that they have had a lot of success shooting the puck this season. And then they got a lot of and then they had a lot of shots from the face off from the right face off dot too. And that was where Tage did score his power play. Um and then even you go to the Vegas game. That's I mean, Vegas is a great team. We I don't yeah. think people in Buffalo want to admit it because <laughs> Because of a certain player. Michael, because of Michael, <laughs> because of the revenge game for him at right. least. And it's like, okay, he got his. We got ours last year. He got his this year. Whatever. Yeah. Vegas is going to. I've been telling people if they are healthy, they're one of the best teams in the league. And people don't want to admit that because they want right. to see Vegas fall off. I'd like to see Vegas fall off too. But guess what? Reality hits. They're really good. They're. They could win the President's Trophy this year, for all we know. And then yeah. they played another team in Boston who probably could win the President's Trophy too if they keep playing the way they the way they are. I got obviously I see the comment here. I've never been more annoyed with the Bruins game. Sabres play played their level all game and at and then that game easily. It could have easily been three to one. Yeah, I was at the game. Like they were the better team. They, they were. really were. Um, they had a, they had more scoring chances. The high danger chances was pretty even because Boston Boston does that. Um, but the Sabres, it, it's just like this five game losing streak that they're on could have easily been a five game winning streak. If just one or two bounces go their way, that's yeah. it. Like that's, I think 
people who are frustrated in the team and who are mad at the team and only care about what the what the scoreboard says i don't know if they realize that hockey is a is a massive game of luck it's just roll it's a massive roll of dice game i have seen statistics that show that hockey is basically like 70 percent luck where you could have the best team of all time you could have a team that's that has Wayne Gretzky, Mario Lemieux, Sidney Crosby, and Connor McDavid as your top four centers. You could have Yari Curry, Mike Bossy on the wing, Luke Robitaille on the wing, uh, Joe Sackick, Peter Fors, whatever. You could have all the Nick Lidstrom on defense, Bobby Orr on defense too. They're they're on they're the top pair. You got Patrick Waller, Dominic Hashik in that. You could have all the the best players of all time, and you could still lose a random game to a team where their best player is like um, the Sedins, let's say right. like you can lose, a, like they'll, they'll lose multiple games. They're not going to go. No, that's why no one in hockey can ever go 82 and 0. it's no. just statistically impossible for that to happen. Right. That's why, I mean, that's why it's an anomaly when you see, like when you saw Tampa win 60 games a few years ago, remember they lost, they got swept in the playoffs. Right. Detroit won 60 games in 96. They didn't even win the cup that year either. Like that's why, because, because hockey's such a, it's such luck based. It really is like one bounce goes your way. And that could be the difference in you winning the game or you losing the game. Really? Like, yeah, I don't, I I don't really take like much into the, I, I, I'm still encouraged by their play. And I think if they just keep playing the way they do, they're going to win more games. Yeah, I you know, I liked the way they played against Boston. I agree, you know, it wasn't like Vegas where, you know, I they they fought, but there were issues. I thought against Boston it was pretty much what we kind of saw against Arizona. Yeah, the puck luck. I mean, you pretty much said it. Um and how but I will say how sweet was that Tage shorthanded goal where he split the Bruins defense and then tucked it in on the backhand. I mean, you know, if, if there's one consistent bright spot, the good thing is, you know, people are a little bit worried, you know, Tate's got that big contract. Is he going to be in the first few games? It looked like he was showing some signs of maybe a little bit of pressure, but he has not shown that lately. He has uh, continued to be a driving force for this offense. And again, I thought he was one of the best players, even in that Boston game on the ice for the Sabres there. And I thought that shorthanded goal, that was a thing of beauty. Yeah. I mean, shots in that game was 36, 35 for for Vegas and the Vegas game. And then in the Boston game, um, let me pull that up really quick. I can just kind of do that. It was 31, 30 for Buffalo. Like they're keeping pace in terms of shooting They're When you look at, uh, when you get like the, the shot attempts, I mean, in the Bruins, in the Boston game at, in all situations, it was dead even 55, 55. And it was just Boston won the high danger game. They, their, their chances was just slightly better than Buffalo's was. It was only at, in, throughout the whole game. It was 16, 13 high danger chances that Boston had. Right. All you have need is one of those high danger chances the Sabres have to go their way. And next thing you know, like that, that's a two, two game at, at that point. Cause B- boss's third goal was an empty netter. So yeah. uh, I just, our, it was very late in the game to at least where it was like, okay, the game's over at that point. But, right. when, but my point is like, they're not get They they're playing well enough to win. They're just not getting bounces. That's I, Ultimately, that's what it is. That is correct. I, I would say if there's one thing, though, Frank, as far as like people that are getting frustrated, I agree with you. But we do have to remember, obviously, the Sabres do right now. It was kind of a lot of the same way when the Bills were going through their playoff drought. You know, it's been, you know, just a lot of the same. You know, they, they dread the long losing streaks because, you know, a few years ago they had the 10-game winning streak. They looked like they were really going. And then – all of a sudden, by the time the new year hit, they were out of the playoff race. And, you know, and we've kind of seen the same story, same old song and dance. So I think a lot of people that are getting frustrated with the results, I think it's just more of a case of, you know, oh, no, here we go again. I mean, yes, it's encouraging to see how well they're playing in these games. Unfortunately, they're uh, not getting rewarded like they should be. 
But um, yeah, overall, I, I have seen a lot of growth of this team. But at the same time, I, I can kind of see where, you know, some of the frustration from some of the fans because it, it's almost just the deja vu all over again. And I, I think it's just part of the nature when you're when you root for a team that does part of hockey off drought like this. It's part of hockey in general. And it's yeah. like it's um what was I gonna say? It, I mean, I I saw it on Twitter. Um, this is almost like the this is basically the opposite of the ten game winning streak. Like they were they won ten in a row, but like they probably shouldn't have. Like they were not the better right. team in all those games. Now they're they're playing like they're the better team, or they're keeping pace with really good teams, and yeah. they're not winning. And it's it's like now, you can't I, really. It's hard to you know. It's hard to it's hard to ask the team to give them to give more yes. than what they've been giving already. And what I, um, what I what I will say to back up that point, Frank, is, you know, the, when you say the luck and it has been against the Sabres, well, generally they say at least percentages tend to even out a little bit. So you got to figure if the Sabres keep playing the way they are, keep putting themselves in these positions, eventually we are going to see maybe some breaks start to go their way. And maybe we'll start to that's see some games that maybe they saying, lose yeah. a little turn into wins. That's basically what I've been saying. Like they're 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 overall they've been an average team this whole season when you look at the overall numbers. And average typically means if you play if they play well, they'll either win have a five game winning streak or have a five game losing streak playing the exact same way. That tends tends to happen um yeah another comment uh team needs samuelson yoki haru back yeah i mean so yoki haru might play yeah. this week we'll see he's he's out of the non-contact jersey so that's a really good sign yeah um i've read i think samuelson's probably another two weeks away so we're looking at probably probably december he comes back early december um I have to say I have been encouraged by how uh, Kale Clegg has played. I think, you know, obviously he's not a guy who you want playing 82 games for your team. If you're playing, if he's playing 82 games, you're probably a bottom five team in the league. But at the same time, I think he's played well enough to where I mean, I might keep, I might want to keep him as my seventh defenseman. Yeah. I don't really think that's, that should be a problem. Um, Maybe, you know, he's probably, gonna go back to rochester once uh once like the defense yeah. gets healthy once samus and and you are back um i i gotta say though like i i'm done with fitzgerald i don't think he's an nhl defenseman at all um they need labushkin to get back into the third pairing roles as well that's where he will succeed that's where the, that's what they signed him for so once samus and yoki are back healthy i mean you'll see the you'll see the d lines be the same again and I hope that they weigh Fitzgerald and we keep Clegg instead, but I don't think they're going to. I think Pilot gets sent back down to um, – I haven't really been that impressed with Pilot since, you know, since he's been called called up, yeah. but maybe that change – maybe that changes. You know, we'll see. Um, yeah. Uh, and same comment, you know, same person. Uh, difference I see between this year and is we got lucky and we are just on the wrong side of the puck this year, but competitive. That's basically it. They're, they're competitive. That's – Really, all you can ask for from this team is the talent is a little better, so they should be better in the standings. But overall, as long as they're in, as long as they're in every game, all you need is just one lucky bounce to have go your way, and they'll win. They'll win games. They'll win a lot of games. Like I, I really do believe that. Yeah, I I would agree, and I think one point you just nailed on too was Labushkin. Um, and, and I think uh, Paul Hamilton made a good point on the post game a few games ago. You know, I think the Sabres, one other thing they miss is Labushkin's like physicalness, his physical play. You know, you didn't see a lot of like, you don't see the other teams taking liberties at all when Labushkin's out there. He's got the toughness. And I think him being out, you know, everyone, uh, yes, we want to get Samuelson back. We want to get Yokoharu back. But I, I think, Frank, you're smart to point out as far as the Bushkin because he's brought a lot more in the physical edge than I really knew because, you know, he was with the Oh, yeah, league, when you watch but... him play, like, he's he's always been, like, more of a physical guy. He's, I mean, I, I mean, I said from, you know, before they even signed him, like, yeah, I could see them going for a defense, but right shot D, who's probably a little more on the physical side, who can help in your own end. Um, I think Samuel, no, and I think Samuelson has the ability 
to do that as well. Um, obviously, he's going to be playing more top minutes and he's going to be expected to have the tougher matchup. So him being more of like, oh, I, you know, you're I'm going to just hit you for because I can. Um, I don't see Samuelson as being that. I just think in terms of hard to play against for Samuelson's sake, it's because, well, he could defend against anybody. That's that also in turn is hard. It means hard to play against. It doesn't have to just be in the physical sense. But like was brought here for that and him being on one foot definitely does not help. So they need they do need him to really, you know, play his game some more. And I think he'll be the most he'll be most effective at that once he starts uh, getting back onto the third pair playing with uh, Bryson. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I, I think I think for the Sabres, you know, you know, once they start getting a little bit healthier, especially once they on the defensive end, I think for sure that I think you're going to see the Sabres really start to take off because you got to remember when they started off hot at seven and three, their first 10 games, for the most part, they were healthy. We saw what yeah. the, what a healthy roster could do. You know, now that they've had to plug in these different players, you know, it's they're still competitive. You see, what, have, you see what happens. Yeah, and I, I still they're think missing a little bit yeah. right now. And obviously, they're going to be making mistakes, but a lot. Of, I think a lot of the frustration with the goaltending, especially Comrie's sake, has has been because the defense isn't as healthy. And I mean, that's just what ha- you know. It's just it happens. It trickles down your lineup. All right, we're gonna take a real quick break. When we come back, um, let's talk about yesterday's Bills game. Let's I got I got some beef that I got to talk about that they really pissed me off yesterday. So when we come, when we come back, we'll be doing that. Frank R. Curry, John Caruba. It's the ranting guest. Tonight's show is brought to you by John and Mary's, a Buffalo tradition for pizza, subs and wings since 1952. From hoagies, subs and wraps to traditional pizza and wings, John and Mary's menu is packed with old time flavors and a few modern twists on classic recipes. You could cool down with Perry's ice cream or warm up with a cup of homemade soup. If you're not in the mood for pizza or wings, we have plenty of other options. Seafood platters, burritos, fresh salads and more. There is something fresh and delicious for everyone at your table. Catering, online ordering, and delivery options available. Located in the heart of Buffalo's theater district, the Buffalo Dinosaur Barbecue occupies a former vault that stored movies for Universal International Pictures. Dinosaur Barbecue has been in Buffalo since 2014 and is located on 301 Franklin Street. Looking for a food stop after your day trip to Niagara Falls? Only 30 minutes away. Back at it on the ranty cast, Frank O'Curry, John Caruba with me. Ron is uh, doing the doing the producing in the background. He's doing a great job as always. Um, so we talked to Sabres in the first segment, the last week of games. Um, they got Ottawa and Vancouver, Vancouver tomorrow, um, Ottawa on Wednesday. So maybe those are the two games they get back on track. We'll see. But um, for now, I got some frustration with the Bills game yesterday. A lot of frustration. Now, Obviously, over if we look at the overall picture, they're still six and three. Great. That's okay. They could easily, this is a team that can easily, easily, and I mean easily, win win out the rest of the rest of the season. They have uh eight, they have eight games left. They got the Browns next week, the Lions on Thanksgiving, the Patriots on December 1st with the Thursday nighter. Jets, Dolphins, Bears, Bengals, Patriots to end the season. They could win all those games, and they could destroy all those teams by multiple scores. We know that they can do that. We know they're good enough. Here is where my frustration comes in. This team cannot... Or, I'm sorry. They, they keep on making simple mistakes. They cannot hold a small lead when they they get all they go up by 14 they can't hold that lead they go up by 30 they can hold that i wonder why so like when you go up by 30 it's like the the team just stops trying because it's like okay we're down by 30 the game's over when you're up by 14 the other team still thinks hey we're still in this we get a touchdown and you get a stop we could tie the game 
and the Bills, for some reason, for some reason, decide to go away from the game plan that got them that lead in the first place. John, I want you to tell me this. What was the thing in the first half of that of the game yesterday that brought them success? What was the what was the thing that they did offensively that gave them that lead that they had in the first place? Well, um, as far as what got them the lead in the first place, I think as far as, you know, running and then passing, like they were, they were getting it. The offense continued and then they just, in the second half, you're right. They totally, totally went away from it. And um, yeah, it ended up, they made a lot of mistakes in the second half and it cost them. I don't know why they got away from it in the second half, but apparently they, they, Maybe they lost confidence. I, 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 yeah, it is kind of mind boggling, especially you're up 24 10 at half. Why don't you just stick with what's working for you? But that's my thing. That's my thing here because I think I have a, I have a reason as to why it happens. They had success running the ball in the first half. Singletary, two touchdowns. And he was running, he was running really well. I mean, he ended up at 47 yards overall in the game. Um, obviously, Josh Allen led the led the way with 84 for the team. Even James Cook was averaging four and a half yards. Um, Duke Johnson was doing really well in special teams. So, but here's the one thing that's here, this is another this is another point that's going out. But the as soon as Devin Singletary fumbles the ball. Now, you can say that his uh, his arm was down and it should never have been ruled a fumble to begin with. I can be with you on that one. However, however, the ball should never leave his arms anyway. If he rolls over on the ground and his arm is hitting the turf and the ball is still in his hands and it never leaves his arms, he's down. But the ball yeah. left his arms. Even if even if that wasn't ruled a fumble, I'm still mad at Singletary because he lost the ball. Even if yeah. it wasn't it wasn't ruled a fumble, the ball came out of his arms. It should never do that. That's no. always been one of his issues. And then because of that, the team decides to just go away from the from the run game. Yeah. yeah. Single, James see. Cook James Cook didn't have I think had one carry in the second half. One, Duke Johnson had two carries the whole game, and I don't even know how many how many carries Singletary had in the second half, but it wasn't many. Yeah, and then and then the other part of it because I I didn't mention another the new running back Naeem Hines, he's had two targets in two games since being traded here. Two, that two was targets in the two game, targets man. in the passing game, zero carries he has not ran the ball once now fine you brought him in to be a pass catcher in the backfield fine why like, is he is that, how's your day i said i'm going great then i out his That's face and i said um why is he only have two targets in two games why tell me like it told tell me it's because they get you're getting him caught up in the playbook you've had I can understand the Jets game fine. No excuses yesterday. None. Yeah. That's a coaching problem. That that goes on Ken Dorsey and that goes on Sean McDermott. It goes on both of them. Yes. Thank I you. Just, Josh has to stop playing hero ball. I agree. How uh, the one thing and obviously I don't put a ton of slack on Cam on Cam Lewis yesterday because he played safety. That was the first time he played safety in the pros, and I thought he played pretty well in that. There was just an unfortunate circumstance that he had to be the the guy who was covering Justin the best Jefferson. catch of the season. The yeah. best catch I mean, after it, what after we saw Stefan Diggs make the best catch of the season, Jefferson had to go one up him for it. It's like it's like at yeah. that point he could have been trying to knock it down and he and Jefferson could have still made the catch. You like know, really, I mean that was an it was an amazing catch. Like there's just nothing you can do on that. It shouldn't uh, even come down to that though. It should never. I don't know how this team continues to fumble away opportunities to put teams away when it's a close game. 
that yeah. they go yeah. up, you know, they go up big in the Rams game. They go up big in the Titans game. They go up big in the Steelers game and they can just sit on the lead, sit on it the rest of the game. This team cannot sit on a two score lead. They can't 24 to 10 and a half. And that team feels like it's not that team feels like we didn't score enough. Well, fine. You didn't score enough. I get it. So then why Keep did going. you go away? From the from the aspect of the game that was giving you scores, yeah. In the second half, why is Josh Allen with a messed up elbow throwing the ball forty three times because of that? Yeah, like I don't I don't care if it, if he says I'm fine, I can I can play my normal normal game. You he's your franchise quarterback. You have okay if you if you have to run the ball more because you don't want him throwing it. Run the ball more. You have four running backs that you can use. Use yeah. them. Yeah. I, I Minnesota's defense is not good. Okay. No. It is not good. But their game plan in the second half made that defense look elite for yeah. no reason. It was there was no reason for it. And all of it, in my opinion, falls on the coaching staff. I the players don't didn't execute, but guess what? If the players are not being put in a position to succeed and a position to execute well, they're going to fail. That's yeah. typically what happens. Yeah. That falls on coaching. Right. I think right. it is I, why I, I tweeted this yesterday too. Part of me, I don't want to have to say it, but part of me really feels like that this team cannot win a Super Bowl. They can win games and they can win playoff games, but can they win a Super Bowl with, with McDermott as coach? I don't know. That's Frank, my my thing. I do not I, know. Frank, I I feel like I want to stand right now and give you a standing ovation for everything you Ugh. just said. Thank you for being the voice just of like, sanity. You know, when you watch a lot of the national media and you watch a lot of other people's takes on this game, what is the first thing they want to do? They want to throw Josh Allen under the bus. And my feeling is, yes, he did have two bad interceptions. I give you that. Yes, he had the fumble near the goal line that obviously gave Minnesota the lead with like 30 seconds left. But why? Come down to it. I do I do think more of the blame does need to go on McDermott. And I, it, it's bizarre. He seems like such an intelligent pro when you listen to him. But he makes these bizarre decisions. And I, I get he doesn't like running backs who fumble the ball. No coach does. But, yeah, to totally abandon the running game, huge mistake. And also, I also have to blame Leslie Frazier a little bit too. Because when they decided not to kick that field goal, at it was 27-17 at that time, and they missed the field goal. Okay, Bad decision. Should have took the field goal. Go up thirty to seventeen. You know that doesn't mean the Vikings have to go down the field and score. If the defense steps up there and stops them, it's still a ten point lead. Instead, what happens? The Vikings get energized by that, and then they attack the defense, and it all of a sudden becomes twenty seven twenty three. To me, that's so, really where the game turned. So. I have a couple things on when you talk about that one play. Um, one, I don't mind them go, not going forward on fourth down. I don't. Okay. Statistically, when you look at the winning percentage from that, there's not much of a difference when it comes to if you if they make the if they go for the field goal and make it versus if they go for if they go for it on fourth down and then convert the first down. Not even get a touchdown, just convert the first. It was fourth and two. I know they're at the seven, but. This also for the overtime drive too. Like, just because you get to a point where you're getting closer and closer to touchdown doesn't mean you have to start taking end zone shots. They didn't. Okay, that's where I, that's where it falls on coaching. You don't have to get that aggressive. Okay, fourth and two. You just need two yards. Get two yards. Have a play that gets you two yards. Okay, to you're that you get two yeah. yards. You're at first and goal at the five. Now then yeah. start taking end zone shots. That's fine. I don't yeah. have an issue with that. I don't have an issue with them going for it on fourth down. You know, like I said, right. this, this, I, this statistically their winning percentage does not change much in converting it versus failing it and go or, or, and then going for the field goal and making the field goal or missing right. the field goal. I, I guess never, they could I, go for the, he could have went for the field goal and Tyler Bass could have missed it. You never know. Right. You, you never know. And then I, you're looking at it and then, 
and I'll say, and then you're looking at McDermott and thinking, why didn't you go for it then? I guess, because that's always what fo football fans do. My problem on that, on that play was the play call. Have a play call that gets you right. two yards. That's all it should be. If it's Josh yeah. Allen taking the ball himself, fine. I yes. don't care if it's that, if it's just a two yard slant to Naeem Hines, fine. If it's two yards up the middle to McKenzie or Dawson Knox or, or Diggs, fine. Right. That's all you don't have to go for the end zone. That's what they tried to do. And yeah. it just ended up being a disaster because Peterson took it out. You know, it was, I think it was Peterson who, or who, uh, who had the, the two interceptions, um, I guess, in that game. Yes, um, because Peterson to, had the one that sealed it. And all yeah, he did. He did. Um, but, but, but even then, even then, yeah, he did have both of them actually. Um, he ends up taking it, you know, to getting yards out of it as well, you know, getting like 40 yards or whatever. Like that made it disaster. But ultimately, that just comes down to the play call itself. You don't right. have to take an end zone shot every single time. You don't. Just get the yards you need. That's right. that's where that's where, where I have the I have the issue. Yes. And, and I, I I agree. Um, I, I guess my larger point was even if even if okay you're okay with going for it i i could see the arguing at least i could see the reasoning behind why it's okay you know i would have taken the field goal but it's fine i can see what i guess my larger point frank though is the defense the way they responded to that you know they could have really taken i mean what was when they signed von miller who's been great to, for the most part to this point this season but, you know, it's always been, you know, Leslie Frazier is one of the best defensive coordinators. Sean McDermott, defensive guy. But we have seen, whether it was the divisional game last year or it was the second half in this game, we have seen that defense, even when they're gifted that 17-point lead, defensively sometimes they lose some of their aggressiveness. And I think that kind of gets lost in what happened. If the defense steps up there, and stops the Vikings after they get that fourth and two stop, it's still a 10 point game. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think we're having a different conversation today. I think the fact that to me, if the bills stop the Vikings on that drive, they win the football game. Yeah. In my opinion. And, but ultimately I think, I think that all comes down. To, I, I do think it all comes down to coaching. Cause you look at Justin right. Jefferson ate up the bills secondary. Cause he was primarily being matched up in one-on-one -on -one situations. And I can I can understand you know a lot of that could also be well. White still has White's not back. Poyer was out. Hides out for the year. Their yeah. three All Pro yeah. secondary guys are out, and it really hurts them. their depth. Now, like I could now, but you could also say well, and they didn't have Elam as two yesterday as well, like True. their first round pick. So your starting corners are going in are Dane Jackson and Christian Benforth, and then Cam Lewis is out there playing safety. And then you brought up, you know, Xavier, Xavier Rhodes too to play. Yeah. Um, so they're really, you know, scratching the scratching their, you know, reaching into their depth box to whatever they have just to just to muster up a, a team for for this game. So like I can understand, you know, them getting kind of cooked in the secondary because of it. But at the same time, like give your guys some help. Yeah. I mean, I've really liked how someone like Damar Hamlin has played. Yes. Since, you know, with Poyer in and out and hide out, I think DeMar Hamlin is becoming a guy who they can really depend on, you know, for yeah. the next years. And then, you know, we know Teron Johnson has always been reliable too. Um, yes. But I don't think the team is doing enough to kind of, they're trying to play the same way they would be if Poyer, Hyde, and Trey were all out there. Yeah. And it's just, it's showing that it's not working. It's, I think yesterday really showed just how special having all three of those guys are. I think yes. it really does. It really having all three out at the same time really completely changes how Welcome they have back to, to this snow look at their uh, known as look at their defense, you know, everything. So I mean, looking at this like Bills Browns snow game, I don't even want to look I don't even want to look Yeah, I remember like, this. This they was lose yeah. because they lost this game. It was like it was like six crap. to three or something like that. I think it was, it was eight three. Yeah, it was horrible. but it's like but it's like at the but it's like I just yeah. It's always these little things that they make that they make a little mistake and it bites them and it it's constant and they lose yeah. because of it. Look at last year. I mean, you lose yeah. the 
You lose the uh, the the game against the Patriots where their quarterback threw the ball three times, yeah. and they were and they made it and they were thinking like he there he's not gonna he's gonna keep he's gonna throw it more often. No, it's fifty mile an hour winds. He's they're gonna run the ball the whole time. Like, yeah, oh, yeah no, you're right. It's that's then, why. I'm, by the way, uh, and then the big one, and then the big one's thirteen seconds. Like you couldn't yeah. stop a team for thirteen seconds, and then they. And, they did it again this year, by the way. This time, Casey had 12 seconds at, in the first half, and they still went down and scored points. Like, yeah. come on. Yeah. I didn't care that much this time this year because of it, because it was like it was the first half and whatever. It didn't really cost them the game. But it's like, but it's these little things that just yes. constantly bite them, and they lose because of it. I know the score was 8 nothing in that game, whatever. I don't care. It was like, 15 years ago at this point, I don't care anymore. That the game does not matter to me. Matter. Um, but it that's where my frustration comes in. They they make small mistakes after small mistakes. And Josh is guilty of it too. You know, yeah. last year against the Titans, he slips after handing yeah. off the after uh, after uh, snapping the ball at the goal line at right at the end of the game. He slips and falls. Like that's a mistake because you shouldn't do that, but it happens. I mean, and yeah. then, and then, th and then yesterday can't handle the snap right at the goal line. And then also too, like, here's another frustration part about that. What was the play call there? If that, if the, if the snap goes off without a hitch, like what were they going to do? I really want to know because to me, it yeah. looked like they were just going to run the run it. And I'm, and I'm just thinking like, are you sh like, you're going to, if it okay, Ron says it was a QB sneak. That's even worse. That is even worse. Okay, yeah. there the ball is right up on the goal line, right up on it. Yeah. If it's, if it's, the Vikings stop Allen, yeah, it's and either I, right at right at the line of scrimmage if you're lucky, or it's a safety. I yeah. do not. Okay, I do not care because I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the play by play really quick. I just want to double check the that score um that made it it was 27 23 at the at the time of that play okay it would have been 27 25 and then what happens after that the bills have to kick the ball away after yeah. a safety and it's it's a two-point game guess what now minnesota all they have to do is in 40 seconds drive down to kick a winning field goal with yeah. the way Justin Jefferson has been playing all game, with the way they've been coaching that secondary, do you really think the Bills would have stopped him then? Because guess what? They got very lucky to stop him at the goal line. Very lucky. Right. Yeah, I don't I trust it at all. That's my yeah. problem. That's another huge problem. And that falls on Ken Dorsey. And that <laughs> falls on Sean McDermott. And it falls on Leslie Frazier. It falls on the entire coaching staff. That's yeah. why I really think that this franchise cannot win a Super Bowl under the current coach. I will say this. I think that he can I think possible. I get that he's that he does make questionable decisions. And the amazing thing is, remember in the Kansas City game, Josh Allen was in that position where they were fourth and back in their goal line. And what does he do? He throws a 20 yard pass, gets the first down. Now I get it's a little bit of a different situation, but like there, they were just trying these little plays up the middle, and Minnesota knew what was coming, and that stuffed them on the second down. And the second down ended up being the fumble. So it was disastrous play calling. Um, you know, and, and I think in a game like that where things really go backwards, there's a lot of different – there's about eight or nine different plays we could talk about that really changed the momentum of that game. But what I would say is, you know, if you're the Bills – you got to find a way, win your next couple. You got Cleveland, Detroit, New England. Now, New England, I know, has a good defense, but they, they have struggled against the Bills since Brady left. So you, you find a way to win those games, get to 11-3. and three. You have the Jets and Dolphins at home back-to-back to, back to try and settle the division like, like and said, then see where the chips fall they could run. That. They could run the table the rest of the yeah. year. They could win their last eight in a row. They They're good enough to do that. My right. problem is, is will the coaching staff let, let, let that yeah. happen? Are yeah, they, well, is this team, team my, I really, I, I really wonder if they're being held back. If this team, like, I think, I think when, when you see this questionable play calling and you're seeing questionable decision-making from Allen, I think a lot of that is based off of poor play calling. 
I mean, look at look at overtime. Look at when it's you know first and ten at the at the Minnesota twenty. Why are you taking end zone shots there? Is yeah. that falling on Josh Allen and what he wants to do, or is that because that's the play? That's what From that's Dorsey what that's McDermott. the call that Ken Dorsey made. I, and I have you a look question at, for you, Frank. As far right. as uh, if it doesn't, as far as McDermott goes, you know, if they don't win the Super Bowl, if they don't get it done this year, do you maybe consider? You know, I mean, I know there's a Sean Payton's out there. Yeah. You know, you you don't want Sean. I don't Payton? think no. I no. I I mean, I wouldn't mind having a Sean Payton as head coach. As head coach, my thing is, I don't think the team does it. I think McDermott's no. got such a such a big pull in that organization and has got such a long leash that it's going to take a disaster scenario yeah. to happen for the for the team to fire him and for and part of me also also thinks. I mean, I love what Brandon Mean has done as GM. Yeah. And I really and I really think they're a package deal where if you fire Sean McDermott, you're firing Brandon Bean too. And if you're firing Brandon Bean, you're firing Sean McDermott. Yeah. Like it does. It's not if you you can't you you can't fire one without firing the other. So that you're kind of tied. Yeah. At, you're kind of tied at that. Yeah, that's kind of a good point. point. I guess the only point that I make about that and the reason I mention it is what does Kansas City have at head coach? You know, we're always talking about you know the Mahomes versus Allen matchup. You know, because Kansas City, Buffalo. Well, what does Kansas City have on the sideline? Now like, they have an established winning coach. They have one of the best offensive minds in the game. You know, Not Sean only... McDermott was a disciple, but he was the defensive guy. But Sean Payton is a very good offensive coach. He always was regarded mm-hmm. with that with Drew Brees in New Orleans. You know, if you want to counter fire with fire, you know, maybe – and Payton's won also. He's been there. You don't see mm-hmm. the bizarre going away from the game plan – like you see with Sean McDermott. Not only is Andy Reid one of the best offensive minds in football, one of the best head coaches, he's very he's very timely with his aggression him being aggressive. I mean, it helps he has Patrick Mahomes as his quarterback, but look at look at what he did in Philly for all those years yes. when he had Donovan McNabb as his mm-hmm. quarterback. I mean, it's not it's really not much different. It's just based on the talent level that you have at, at, at that position. And I mean yeah. And I mean, it's it's like it's like, I I think Andy Reid lets Patrick Mahomes be Patrick Mahomes a lot more than Ken Dorsey and Sean McDermott let Josh Allen be Josh Allen. We've seen Josh Allen put the team on his back and lead them to a win. Where and he does, you know, it's one of those things where I was having a conversation with. Um, one of my friends yesterday after the you know yesterday night after the game and you know he's he's constantly wondering like why is Josh Allen what what is Josh Allen's decision making in this you know and all that and I talk about you know maybe and I talk about like I said earlier maybe it's because he just don't go doing what the play what the play is telling him to do what, what the coaches are telling him to do and I and you know he asked me well Josh Allen needs to learn to he needs to be you know if it's not there, he, she couldn't, she should be taking it. That's on him to make the right decision. And I'm just, you know, wondering like, is he just thinking too much? Is he, is he worried that if he makes the wrong play, if play based on what the coaches are asking him to do, he's gonna, you know, hear it from the coach or something. I don't know. Like, you know, you look at like Josh Allen cannot override the coach. He can't, he's not like, he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league. But he can't tell the coach, don't give me a play. I got this, you know, Yeah. like he's like, you know, like what Aaron Rodgers has been doing, had been doing for years, like what Tom Brady does right now, like what Peyton Manning did for had done for a number of years. He's not that kind of guy. He's not that guy yet. And I, I think you get that. I do think you get that with experience where you can, where the coach will tell you, Hey, run this play. And then, but then the quarterback is, is like, I was like, I'll think about that. You know, I got to play, I got a better play, you know, or something like, or something like just something like that. I don't know. I got, I just, I don't think Allen's at that level yet. And, you know, and I just really, you know, he's playing too much. I wonder if he's just playing too much in the, in the system of what Dorsey wants and he's not trying to, you know, do what he thinks, well, you know, what he thinks can help him help this team win. And, And, but we see what happens when he does that. We've seen him do it though. We see him, put the team on his back and win games. When Josh Allen breaks a play, it's typically because he's running the ball. 
He's taking it himself and going. That's typically Josh Allen breaking what the play call was. Yeah. We don't see him break the play call to make another throw. Yeah. I don't right. know and if I, you know, I, I think to, uh, to follow up on also on your point, when you say about Brady Rogers, all those guys, Mahomes to get to that level where you can tell, like you can basically run your own offense. You got to get a ring. Obviously that's the one thing Allen for all his accolades. That, yeah. That's what he's missing is that, but I mean, the, the one good thing, and I think the reason why I still, even though I question McDermott a ton, um, the one thing, the reason that I think they could win it with him, though, is when you look at the resume of who they've beaten this year, you know, you saw their clock management, their game management against Baltimore was very good, and mm -hmm. McDermott got the better of Harbaugh. They beat Lamar Jackson in his place. They beat Mahomes in his place for the second regular season game in a row. They beat the Rams on opening night, the defending champion. They beat Aaron Rodgers, so they have. And then they beat the Titans, who were the number one seed last year and lead their division. You know, say what you want about the AFC South. They're still a division leader. And they basically beat the Vikings yesterday had they not fumbled at the goal line because of the play calling. So I think the resume is still very encouraging. I think – most of their tough sledding they've gotten out of the way and have come out of it at six and three. And really, like you said earlier, Frank, they could easily be eight and one or nine and oh, had some of those easily. decisions maybe been different. And now they're entering the weak part of their schedule. The only thing they got to avoid the Jacksonville game like last year, where they lost to a team they shouldn't have lost to. They need to make that, sure I they wonder come out yeah. and, and set the tone and let the Browns and the Lions especially, and even the Patriots, I'm lumping them in there, that you got to come out and let them know you got no shot today, and they got to keep that intensity going for all four quarters. Don't take your foot off the gas. They didn't I, use to. Lately, they have. I do wonder if that Jacksonville game was the Jets game from last week. Yes, the only well, thing I think Jets' defense was better. Yeah, but yeah, Jags defense isn't better. all that bad too. And it's like yeah, last like, year, last year you could say, like, yeah, that was just a derp game. They just they messed up and everything. But like right. they shouldn't have lost last week to the Jets as well. There was no no reason to lose that. No, they shouldn't up, have, there was but, no reason to put up 17 points again against the Jets, no matter how good their defense is. Because right. and, and the Patriots defense is good too, and they put up 47 in the playoffs. Like yeah. that, like uh, losing to a good defense with this offense with Josh Allen at quarterback with Stephon Diggs. Ever at, at receiver, it, it's just like that's not an excuse. Yeah, you're good enough. They're good enough. They, they put up 30 points yesterday and lost. Like, yeah, I'll, and you can, and I think most of that just falls on falls on coaching. I, I yeah. really do. And like it really, yeah. it really feels like the only way Sean McDermott looks like the better head coach in a game is when the other coach loses. Loses. Yeah. He doesn't win it. They lose it. And then he yeah. loses it. And then he loses most of the time. That's just kind of where right. I'm at. And um that's that's gonna do it for the that's gonna do it for the show. We're yeah. you know, about 50 minutes in and whatever. Um, yeah, Bills Cleveland next week. You know, maybe they get back on track. Um, Sabres, uh, Wednesday. So.